was in shock when the Holocaust, the most horrific act in the history of mankind, became known. How was such an atrocity humanly possible? Never again became the call for unity among the nations. Anti-Semitism and racism will never be tolerated again. But historical lessons were forgotten, and as memory faded, anti-Semitism grew and spread until it became a worldwide crisis. Dr. Moshe Kantor, president of the European Jewish Congress, dedicated himself to renewing the world's commitment to Holocaust remembrance and the fight against anti-Semitism. In 2005, Dr. Cantor, together with Yad Vashem, established the World Holocaust Forum to raise awareness and fight hate and racism. Ladies and gentlemen, only three years passed after Kristallnacht and Van Zee meeting took place. And the broken window and burned synagogue were converted to death camps for the humanity. We know just now that the historical processes are accelerating. Today, only 60 years after the tragedy, we see again criminal tolerance to intolerance. We cannot stay aside. It's time to act. What are we doing to prevent this from happening again? Plus d'un million et demi d'êtres humains avaient été assassinés. Since its founding, four forums have been held, each aimed at engraving on the world's consciousness our sacred duty to remember the past and our collective responsibility to apply history's lessons to the present and future. The forums brought together world leaders and distinguished officials from 60 countries. By raising awareness globally, the issue of anti-Semitism and hate is now recognized as an urgent issue. Мы обязаны в один голос заявить нынешнему и будущим поколениям: никто не может и не имеет права быть равнодушным к антисемитизму, национализму, ксенофобии, расовой или религиозной нетерпимости. It is a sad and painful when this man memory of Shah, memory of the Second World War, hours or days is being questioned. We are reminded that anti-Semitism may begin with words, but rarely stops with words. And the message of intolerance and hatred must be opposed before it turns into acts of horror. We are strong, we have power, we have influence, and this obliges us with our power to stand up when the evil is appearing, to do it every day in our parliaments, in our daily life, on the streets, we must stand up and say, not with us. The perpetrators of that crime tried to annihilate the entire Jewish people, but they failed. Because 65 years ago today, when the gates flew open, you were still standing. 75 years have passed since the concentration camps were liberated by the Allied forces. Remembering the past is our duty, but it's not enough. It is our responsibility to secure the future generations of mankind. Your Majesties, Your Highnesses, Your Excellencies, dear Holocaust survivors, distinguished guests, Shalom, and welcome to the Fifth World Holocaust Forum, Remembering the Holocaust, Fighting Anti-Semitism. This historic gathering on the Mount of Remembrance in Jerusalem is organized by the World Holocaust Forum Foundation, together with Yad Vashem, under the auspices of the President of the State of Israel, His Excellency, Mr. Reuven Rivlin. The Shoah, Holocaust, was the systematic murder of six million Jewish children 
women and men by the Nazis and their collaborators. Motivated by their extreme racist anti-Semitic ideology, the Nazis and their collaborators sought to exterminate the entire Jewish people, to annihilate their culture and heritage, and to cruelly persecute other groups. It is particularly meaningful that this event is taking place at Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center in Jerusalem. We gather here to honor the survivors, remember the victims, and to gain insights from their stories that are significant and relevant for our present and our future. We also recall the remarkable legacy of Jewish resistance during the Holocaust. Jews fought heroically under impossible circumstances. They retained their dignity through extraordinary daily attempts to maintain family and communal ties and observe sacred traditions. It is my honor to invite His Excellency, Mr. Reuven Ruvi Rivlin, President of the State of Israel, to deliver opening remarks. Dear Holocaust survivors, your majesties, your royal highnesses, your excellencies, presidents, prime minister, heads and president of parliaments, representative of many delegations who came to us, distinguished guests and all my friends. And I have so many good friends because Israel has so many good friends. Welcome, welcome to Jerusalem. Yesterday we talked Yesterday, we talked in English, and today, here, from the heights of Yad Vashem, no, next to the Herzl Mountain, I would like to express my words in Hebrew, and you have a direct translation. So if you are ready with a direct translation, I'll start. They sing on the 27th of January, 1945, the gates of hell were opened, Auschwitz, that greatest enterprise in the history of mankind for the extermination of a people was liberated. The atrocities that were shown and revealed to the Red Army troops were absolutely incomprehensible, intolerable. Zinovi Kolachevo, a Jew, an artist, and a soldier in the Red Army, described what he saw with his own eyes. The earth is sighing with the atrocities that those victims suffered. I could not tear myself from that portion of the land that was cursed in the history of mankind. All my body was horrified, and I was moaning and sobbing bitterly. Thus he wrote, in the camp itself, there were, there were bodies, thousands of people dying and dead. Yes, some of them children, too. Many, many children. There were half naked skeletons, some of them Muslims, emaciated. A million six hundred thousand human beings were in Auschwitz. Nearly a million and a half of them were Jews. 
They were all slaughtered. A million and six hundred thousand human beings, a million and a half of them were Jews. On a little piece of paper with a pencil, a corporal Dolcacetto wrote on this little slip of paper, and he wrote and wrote and reiterated again and again so that it would be remembered, so that he would never forget, so that he would never forget that he would always remember. We too are here standing, kings, leaders, statesmen, heads of states and government here in Yad Vashem, Jerusalem, in order to remember and never forget. On behalf of the Jewish people, and here as the president of the state of Israel, I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for having come here. Thank you for your solidarity with the Jewish people, for your commitment, for your commitment to remember the Shoah, for your commitment to the citizens of the world, for those who believe in freedom and the dignity of mankind. At the end of November 1943, for the first time in Tehran, the three superpower leaders met those who had actually wage that war in Germany. That was not just a meeting of friends, not at all. It was one with tremendous suspicions embedded in it, suspicions and suspiciousness, because there was an abyss of differences between them. But those three leaders chose. They chose because it was incumbent upon them to choose, to elevate themselves above, uh, above the controversies because of one such elevated objective of the Nazi regime being totally destroyed. For the sake of mankind, that was what the alliance was for. For the sake of humanity, for millions of human beings of my people who were exterminated and slaughtered in the Shoah and tens of hundreds of thousands of millions who died, the victims of the Second World War, the Allies chose too late. Alongside that, they succeeded in facing the Nazi monster and saying, no more. At the end of the day, freedom and dignity and an alliance for the sake of life, they are the ones that became victorious over the Second World War, and that is not to be taken for granted. What would have happened in a world wherein the Allies would not have united, in a world wherein the racist theory would have been the, the superpower that would have overruled everything? Well, we are here today, and we knew what the international arena was able to do, united in order to fight together for one objective, and what they can do today, and they will continue acting together based on those shared common values, fighting against racism and anti-Semitism, against radical forces that are disseminating chaos, and destruction and hatred. We must stand side by side as a wall, shoulder to shoulder, against it for the sake of humanity and humankind. At the end of the Second World War, the era of responsibility actually was embarked upon. In other words, after the atrocities of the Holocaust and the war, the states chose to conduct themselves the with responsibility. The national democracies have always reacted, and the fruit that have been harvested have been in accordance with that. 
after all, enlightenment and eradication of disease. We should never see in democracy something to be taken for granted. It is not thus. We must distance ourselves from remembering that destruction and the Holocaust and the Second World War. But it is incumbent upon us to remember, even nowadays, dear, distinguished guests, the esteemed heads of states here, we must sense and we need that responsibility. My distinguished guests, the Jewish people is a people that remembers. We remember not because we have a sense of supremacy and not in order to sort of just think about those atrocities the whole time and the self-justice, no. But we remember because we understand that if we do not remember, then history can be repeated. Not only human beings burned in those horrible ovens in Auschwitz, but liberty, freedom, and human solidarity also came up in that smoke through the chimneys. The Nazi Germany tried to slaughter and exterminate the people, hoping to eradicate the Jews and get rid of them, wipe them off the map. But there, the Nazi racist views caused the death of over 66 million human beings, men and women. Let us not be confused. Anti-Semitism does not only stop with Jews. But racism and anti-Semitism is a malignant disease that dismantles people and states and countries, and no society, no democracy is immune to that. My dear distinguished guests, the state of Israel is not a compensation for the Holocaust. It was not incepted in order to, con to compensate them for the events that took place. But it was established because it is our homeland, the homeland of the Jewish people. And we came from there and always returned to it after 2,000 years, a millennia of exile. Israel, Israel is a strong democracy, a strong democracy. And yes, a very proud member in the League of Nations, not awaiting for redemption, but waiting for partnership that demands partnership, partnership, a fully fledged one in the struggle and battle against anti-Semitism, the new and the old one that, that is looming above us now in a different shape, the talking about national purity and the hate, and xenophobia, and that is uh, taking a terrible toll and price of in the lives of people. It is a chronic disease. It is from the right, emanating from the left to changing shape, metamorphosizing itself. Anti-Semitism has not changed. Yes, but we have. The state of Israel is no longer, is not a victor. We will always defend ourselves in our country and because this is the homeland and the state of the Jewish people, and it will always be responsible for the Jewish communities abroad for their safety and security. The state of Israel is an integral part of the international 
League of Nations, and we make sure that we're going to strengthen scientific and moral and other values for the entire world. We, order, in, we intend to curb all the terror forces that want to actually wreak terror and chaos around the world. All the citizens of the world who believe in freedom can be detrimentally affected by that, and thus we will continue conducting ourselves. I would like to thank you once again. A vote of gratitude to statesmen, ladies and gentlemen, true partners for having come here on behalf of the people of Israel, the government of Israel, the Knesset of Israel, the law of Israel, and the IDF. I would like to thank you once again for having come here. We would like to thank you for your commitment to the security of the Jewish communities, especially in such dire times. We would like to thank all those who have already adopted the anti-Semitic um, new definition by IHRA, and we are calling upon all the countries of the world who have not as yet adopted to adopt it. It is a very useful tool in the battle against anti-Semitism on an educational and a public level, but also on the enforcement level. Together, all of us will continue striving to struggle and combat anti-Semitism, racism, hatred, hatred for the sake of hatred. We will struggle against denial of the, of the Holocaust and forgetting it. We will continue educating our children and ensure that history will not be repeated because the era of such accountability and responsibility of all of us here has not concluded. My distinguished, dearest, dearly beloved Holocaust survivors who are with us here today, you are our miracle. And what you, your strength, we saw, I saw as a child how you came to Israel, built houses, established new families, planted trees, and you, with that, with what you suffered, you promised us our future in a democratic and Jewish, Jewish and democratic state, all entwined together. No, there is no such thing as a Jewish state without democracy, for we Jews can only live in a democratic state, and thus we will continue. The love of humankind and your love of Israel, they are our moral compass that we will follow in the footsteps of may the victims, our brothers, our brethren, be blessed. All those who struggled against the Nazis, the righteous among the nations, and their descendants of many families are here with us. And I know of those heads of state, know them well. They are here amongst us. And we know that they are all engraved in our hearts ad infinitum. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts for this partnership in your fight for remembrance and the eradication of and, and your commitment to the eradication of anti-Semitism, racism, and hatred. Thank you, President Rivlin. Ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency Vladimir Putin, President of the Russian Federation, is now entering the hall.
It is now my honor to invite His Excellency, Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister of the State of Israel, to deliver his remarks. May the, pre the President of the State of Israel thank you for having initiated and convening this important conference. My brethren, the Holocaust survivors, distinguished guests, the righteous amongst the nations, the righteous among the nations, who risk not only their own lives, but the lives of their families to save Jews during the Holocaust. The trees, the trees on this hallowed ground of Yad Vashem are a testament to their remarkable extraordinary courage. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highnesses, Presidents, Mr. Vice President, Prime Ministers, and the many distinguished guests and dignitaries assembled here. Your presence in Jerusalem honors the memory of the six million victims of the Holocaust Israel and the Jewish people, thank you. Auschwitz and Jerusalem, an abyss and a summit. Auschwitz, the destruction, Jerusalem, the resurrection. Auschwitz was the incarceration, Jerusalem, enslavement. Achirut. Jerusalem is freedom, Auschwitz, liberty. Amavitz, Auschwitz was death. Jerusalem, Jerusalem is life. 75, 75 years ago, our people, the Jewish people, were liberated from the valley of death. It was the biggest ever, the greatest ever in the history of mankind. No one of those who survived have forgotten a thing. The helplessness, the insufferable moments that never ended, the flames, the smoke, and the mourning, the loss. Slowly but surely, at the same time, they feel a tremendous vote of gratitude for the day of the liberation when the Red Army marched into Auschwitz. That tremendous sacrifice of the allies, of the soldiers, and the people. I am here today with President Rivlin and President Putin from a very moving ceremony of the inauguration of a monument after the siege of Leningrad. And that is one of the intolerable actual um, realizations of what that victory over the Nazism of Nazism was. But on such a day, it is incumbent upon us to say, for the six million people of our people, a million and a half children amongst them, that those gates of hell were broken into too late. And therefore, in the foundation of the resurrection and this inception of the state of Israel, there is one decree. There will never be another Holocaust. As a Prime Minister of the State of Israel, that is my most supreme commitment. Israel is eternally grateful to the immense sacrifice that was made by the Allies, by the peoples and the soldiers, to defeat the Nazis and save our common civilization. Without that sacrifice, there would be 
no survivors today. Yet we also remember that some 80 years ago, when the Jewish people faced annihilation, the world largely turned its back on us, leaving us to the most bitter of fates. For many, Auschwitz is the ultimate symbol of evil. It is certainly that. The tattooed arms of those who passed under its infamous gates, the piles of shoes and sun eyeglasses seized from the dispossessed in their final moments, the gas chambers and crematoria that turned millions of people into ash, all these bear witness to the horrific depths to which humanity can sink. But for the Jewish people, Auschwitz is more than the ultimate symbol of evil. It is also the ultimate symbol of Jewish powerlessness. It is the culmination of what can happen when our people have no voice, no land, no shield. Today, we have a voice, we have a land, and we have a shield. Today, our voice is heard in the White House and in the Kremlin, in the halls of the United Nations and the American Congress, in London, Paris, and Berlin, and in countless capitals around the world, many of them represented here by you. Today, we have a land, our ancient homeland, which we brought back to life, to which we ingathered the exiles of our people, and in which we built an advanced and powerful state. And today, we have a shield, and what a shield it is. Time after time, the strength of our arms, the courage of our soldiers, and the spirit of our people have prevailed against those who sought to destroy us. Our hand is extended in peace to all our neighbors, and a growing number of them are seizing it to build with Israel bridges of hope and reconciliation. Ladies and gentlemen, the Jewish people have learned the lessons of the Holocaust, to take, always to take, seriously the threats of those who seek our destruction, to confront threats when they are small, and above all, even though we deeply, deeply appreciate the great support of our friends to always have the power to defend ourselves by ourselves. We have learned that Israel must always remain the master of its fate. The Jewish state, the Jewish state has learned the lessons of the Holocaust. As the world learned, the lessons of the Holocaust. There are some signs of hope, and this extraordinary gathering is one of them. Today, the dangers of racism, hateful ideologies, and anti-Semitism are better understood. Many recognize a simple truth, that what starts with the hatred of the Jews doesn't end with the Jews. Represented here today are governments that understand that confronting anti-Semitism in all its forms protects their societies as well. And Israel deeply appreciates this. We also appreciate, as many understand, as President Macron said yesterday, that anti-Zionism is merely the latest form of anti-Semitism. These are all These are all real signs of hope and understanding and cognizance 
of how to protect our civilization and our world. And yet, and yet I am concerned. I'm concerned that we have yet to see a unified and resolute stance against the most anti-Semitic regime on the planet, a regime that openly seeks to develop nuclear weapons and annihilate the one and only Jewish state. Israel salutes President Trump and Vice President Pence for confronting the tyrants of Tehran that subjugate their own people. The tyrants of Tehran that subjugate their own people and threaten the peace and security of the entire world. They threaten the peace and security of everyone in the Middle East and everyone beyond. I call on all governments to join the vital effort of confronting Iran. In any case, I wish to assure again our people and all our friends Israel will do whatever it must do to defend our state, defend our people, and defend the Jewish future. Ladies and gentlemen, as the Prime Minister of the State of Israel, I obligate myself, I commit that those words, never again, will not be an empty slogan, but it will be an ongoing decree, an imperative that must be followed, continuing and following that voyage of resurrection that started in Isaiah's day of the dry bones. From enslavement and liberty and freedom from Auschwitz to Jerusalem, from darkness to light, in the words of Isaiah the prophet, for the people walking in the darkness, they saw a great light. Thank you very much, one and all. Thank you, Prime Minister Netanyahu. It is my honor to invite the founder and president of the World Holocaust Forum Foundation and president of the European Jewish Congress, Dr. Moshe Kantor, to deliver his remarks. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highnesses, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, and dear, dear Holocaust survivors. I would like to begin by expressing my deepest gratitude to President Rivlin, who two years ago strongly strongly supported the idea to lead the World Holocaust Forum in Jerusalem under the special partnership of Yad Vashem and European Jewish Congress. I would like to address here today just three points. Number one, why is anti-Semitism threat to humanity and not only for Jewish people. Number two, what is the situation today of anti-Semitism and especially for European Jews? And number three, what are the practical steps that must be taken to stop this threat? When granting equal rights to the Jews of France, Napoleon Bonaparte said, the national attitude towards Jews is the barometer of society's civilization. And why is that? Historically, Jews were always among the most loyal citizens of their countries and did their best to integrate and to become pillars of society in all walks 
of life. Those who wanted to dismantle the fabric of society, extremists, from both right and left, the Jews were always a symbol of society's foundations. Rejection of the Jews was a rejection of the world order. They were always the first target, but by no means the last. The Nazi erased one third of Jewish people, six million. But in total, more than 60 million people were killed during the Second World War. And the world just stopped at the gates of destruction. If extremists are not stopped at the gates of anti-Semitism, they will eventually take over executive power in their states. And what is the situation today? Who could imagine that just 75 years after the Holocaust, Jews would again be afraid to walk the streets of Europe wearing Jewish symbols? Who would have imagined that synagogues would be attacked again and cemeteries desecrated and even destroyed on a regular basis? As president of the European Jewish Congress, I can only offer you a picture of communities hiding behind high fences and thick security doors. More than 80% of them feel unsafe in Europe today, while more than 40% are considering leaving Europe entirely, and in recent years, 3% have done so annually. If we think about this figure for a moment, it means that at this rate, in only 30 years, there could be no Jews in Europe. What must be done? Firstly, we must educate about the Holocaust and about the dangers of anti-Semitism, racism, and xenophobia, and particularly from the very early age. Secondly, we must introduce meaningful legislation. Finally, thirdly, fully enforce it. In this regard, there is so much that we can learn from one another. For example, Germany adopted a law two years ago against online hate speech addressing one of the most powerful platforms that anti-Semitism and racism today, the internet. The United States has recently addressed the growing anti-Semitism on university campuses with an executive order which permits restricting of federal funds for universities that do not combat anti-Semitism. France passed legislation against boycotts of people and products based on nationality, addressing the new type of anti-Semitism which targets the Jewish state. Just a few weeks ago, they passed a resolution acknowledging that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Great Britain is a model of how effectively to respond to anti-Semitism. It created a task force combined of law enforcement agencies, legal institutions, and civil society organizations to effectively coordinate and act against anti-Semitism. And Russia, where we find maybe the lowest rates of anti-Semitism due to a very uncompromising long-term policy towards anti-Semitism. And anti-Semitic incidents are treated with maximum severity, therefore practically eliminating anti-Semitism in the public arena. These five positive examples of strong leadership 
should be common all over Europe and all over the world. So, to resume, we have to equate legally and practically the words and actions of anti-Semitism to the words and actions of extremism and even terrorism. Otherwise, it will be too late. When extremism takes over executive power country by country, which means your power and our mutual future. We are together today, united in our words and in our belief for a future free from anti-Semitism, racism, and xenophobia. Together, we will plant the seeds of trust and believe so that our daily prayers for salvation will be answered. I thank each and every one of you for being here, for your dedication, belief, and commitment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cantor. We are honored to have with us here an international philharmonic orchestra made up of musicians from Russia, France, Germany, Israel, Poland, and the United States. This orchestra is led by artist for peace, Maestro Vladimir Spivakov. It will now perform the piece Evening Prayer Last Night in the Ghetto from the symphony Yellow Stars, composed by Isaac Schwartz.
The Allied nations came together in order to defeat Nazi Germany and its collaborators. Their joint efforts and unity of purpose saved the world from Nazi evil. The Red Army bravely and resolutely led the defeat of the Nazis on the Eastern Front and together with its allies freed Europe from the Nazi grip. Soviet troops liberated Majdanek, Auschwitz-Birkenau, and other Nazi camps. It is my honor to invite His Excellency, Mr. Vladimir Putin, President of the Russian Federation, to deliver his remarks. Mr. President, Prime Minister, colleagues, friends, ladies, gentlemen, we've gathered today at this international forum to honor the memory of the Holocaust victims. It is our shared responsibility that has brought us together, the debt we owe to the past and to the future. We mourn for all the victims of the Nazism, including six million Jews tortured to death in ghettos and concentration camps, atrociously slaughtered in punitive expeditions. 40% of them are citizens of the former Soviet Union. So for us, the Holocaust has always been for us a deep wound. It is a tragedy we shall never forget. Before coming to Jerusalem, I read the authentic documents, the briefs from the officers of the Red Army after the liberation of Auschwitz. I have to tell you, colleagues, it is very difficult to read these details that speak in detail how this camp was organized, how this machinery for the cold-blooded extermination of people was working. It is almost unbearable to read. Many of them are handwritten by the soldiers and officers of the Red Army on the second, the third day after the liberation of the prisoners. And these braves give us a chance to feel the shock that they felt when they saw what was happening there. They witnessed things that made them feel pain, indignation, and compassion. Marshal Konev, who was in charge of the military operation to take the densely populated Silesian industrial area of Germany, tried to save as many civilians as possible. Once he was informed of the atrocities that were happening in Auschwitz, he forbade himself from even seeing that concentration camp. Subsequently, he wrote in his memoirs that he did not have the right to lose back then his fortitude. He did not have the right to let the righteous feeling of vengeance blind him because that would have brought about additional victims among the innocent people that lived in Germany. Uh, January the 27th is going to mark the 75th anniversary since the liberation of Auschwitz. This help it where people from different countries were driven to be tortured, experimented upon, and exterminated in droves. The help it took the lives of hundreds of thousands of people, including more than one million Jews. Crimes perpetrated by Nazis, they are carefully thought through, planned, final solution to the Jewish question, as they called it. That is, colleagues, it's one of the blackest, the most shameful pages in the world history. Nor should we forget that this crime had accomplices whose cruelty often surpassed that of their masters. Those death factories and concentration camps were operated not just by Nazis, but by their henchmen and accomplices in many European countries. It's where these thugs operated in the occupied territories of the Soviet Union that the biggest number of Jews were slaughtered. In Ukraine, 1.4 million Jews were slaughtered. In Lithuania, 220,000 people. I 
like to draw your attention to the fact that that is 95% of the pre-war Jewish population of Lithuania in Latvia. 77,000 people, and so on and so forth. Just several hundred Latvian Jews managed to survive the Holocaust. Holocaust is a deliberate extermination of people. And I have to remind you that Nazis had in store the same fate for many other nations. Russians, Belarusians, Ukrainians, Poles, other nationalities were declared as inferior people. And their lands were supposed to become a Lebensraum for Nazis to provide them with a comfortable existence, whereas Slavonic nations were condemned either to be exterminated or to be reduced to slaves with no voice of their own, with no culture, historical memory, or language. Back then, in 1945, the end to these barbaric plans was put first and foremost by the Soviet nation, as was mentioned, it managed to protect its fatherland and brought freedom to Europe. We paid a terrible price. And heard of before by any nation. We, we, we had to sacrifice 27 million people. That was the price of victory. The memory of the Holocaust will only become a lesson and a warning if it is comprehensive and integral, with no cuts or omissions. Regrettably, right now, the memory of war and its lessons fall victim, increasingly often to short-term political interest which is absolutely inadmissible. The duty of current politicians, political leaders and statement is to protect the good name of both living and fallen heroes as well as innocent people who fell victim to Nazis and their henchmen. And to do that, we need to use all opportunities, information, political and cultural, the authority and clout of our countries throughout the world. I am confident that everyone attending the forum shares these concerns and is willing to stand together with Russia to protect the truth and justice. And we certainly all bear responsibility to make sure that the terrible tragedies of the past war should never repeat themselves. We have to make sure that future generations remember the horrors of Holocaust and concentration camps, the siege of Leningrad, as Prime Minister Netanyahu has said. We've inaugurated a monument to honor the victims of the siege of Leningrad. They have to remember Babi Yar, as well as the village of Hattin burnt to the ground. They have to be vigilant not to miss when the first sprouts of hatred, of chauvinism, of xenophobia and anti-Semitism start to rear their ugly head. When uh, we see surreptitious attempts to condone xenophobia or other manifestations of these phenomena, the oblivion of the past, fragmentation in the face of threats can bring about terrible consequences. We need to find the courage not just to speak about that directly, but also to do everything in our power to protect peace. I believe that the founding members of the United Nations should lead by example the five nations incumbent upon which has special responsibility to preserve our civilization. With some of our counterparts, we've discussed this. And as far as I understand, on the poll, the attitude is positive. We suggest that a meeting should be held of the state, uh, heads of state and government of the P5, Russia, China, the US, France, and the UK. It can take place in any country, at any place of the world where counterparts find it convenient. Russia is willing to engage in a serious conversation. And without further ado, we are willing to send this address to the leaders of the European and Security Council P5. We have many important issues at hand. Just recently, one of those issues, Libya, was discussed in Berlin at the initiative of Chancellor Merkel, but we'll have to get back to that to the at the United Nations adopt a resolution. But there are many other issues. Holding such a meeting in 2020, I believe, is going to be emblematic as we will celebrate the 75th anniversary since the end of the Second World War, as well as since the establishment of the United Nations, a summit of nations that made the main contribution to routing the aggressor to building a post-war world order that could play an important role in finding collective
collective responses to the challenges and threats of today, and it will demonstrate our common devotion to alliance and also historical memory to those lofty ideals and values our forefathers fought side by side for. And in conclusion, I would like to say thank you to our Israeli colleagues for the warm and hospitable welcome here in Jerusalem and wish the participants of the conference as well as all citizens of Israel peace and all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Putin. The entry of the United States into the war was critical in the Allies' fight against Nazi Germany and the other Axis powers, liberating Western Europe and ensuring the Allies' eventual victory. American soldiers freed Buchenwald, Dachau, and other Nazi concentration camps. It is my honor to invite His Excellency, Mr. Mike Pence, Vice President of the United States of America, to deliver his remarks. President Rivlin, Prime Minister Netanyahu, your Majesties, Presidents, Excellencies, honored survivors, and distinguished guests. It is deeply humbling for me to stand before you today on behalf of the American people as we mark the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. On this occasion, here on Mount Herzl, we gather to fulfill a solemn obligation, an obligation of remembrance, to never allow the memory of those who died in the Holocaust to be forgotten by anyone anywhere in the world. The word remember appears no fewer than 169 times in the Hebrew Bible, for memory is the constant obligation of all generations. And today, we pause to remember what President Donald Trump rightly called the dark stain on human history, the greatest evil ever perpetuated by man against man in the long catalog of human crime. The faces of a million and a half children reduced to smoke under a silent sky for the crime of having a single Jewish grandparent. The night Elie Wiesel, called seven times sealed, consumed the faith of so many then and challenges the faith of so many still. Today we remember what happens when the powerless cry for help and the powerful refuse to answer. The town's name was Osvenshem. As part of their plan to destroy the very existence of Polish culture, the Nazis gave Polish towns German names. And this one they called Auschwitz. When soldiers opened the gates of Auschwitz on January 27, 1945, they found 7,000 half-starved, half-naked prisoners, hundreds of boxes of camp records that documented the greatest mass murder in history. Before the war was over, in its five years of existence, more than 1.1 million men, women, and children would perish at Auschwitz. As my wife and I can attest firsthand from this past year, one cannot walk the grounds of Auschwitz without being overcome with emotion and grief. 
One cannot see the piles of shoes, the gas chambers, the crematoriums, the lone boxcar facing the gate to the camp, and those grainy photographs of men, women, and children being sent to their deaths without asking, how could they? Today we mourn with those who mourn and grieve with those who grieve. We remember the names and the faces and the promise of the six million Jews who were murdered in the Holocaust. Today we also pay tribute to those who survived, who all these years have borne witness to that evil and have served mankind by their example. And today we honor and remember the memory of all the Allied forces, including more than two million American soldiers who left hearth and home, suffered appalling casualties, and freed a continent from the grip of tyranny. And finally, we pay tribute to the memory of those non-Jewish heroes who saved countless lives. Those the people of Israel call the righteous among the nations. In an age of indifference, they acted. In an age of fear, they showed courage. And their memory and their example should kindle anew the flame of our hearts to do the same in our time. We must be prepared to stand as they did against the wave of their times. We must be prepared to confront and expose the vile tide of anti-Semitism that is fueling hate and violence all across the world, and we must stand together. In that same spirit, we must also stand strong against the leading state purveyor of anti-Semitism, against the one government in the world that denies the Holocaust as a matter of state policy and threatens to wipe Israel off the map, the world must stand strong against the Islamic Republic of Iran. And finally, we must have the courage to recognize all the leaders and all the nations that are gathered here that today we have the responsibility and the power to ensure that what we remember here today can never happen again. Mr. Prime Minister, as we honor and remember the six million Jewish martyrs of the Holocaust, the world can only marvel at the faith and resilience of the Jewish people, who just three years after walking in the valley of the shadow of death rose up from the ashes to reclaim a Jewish future and rebuild the Jewish state. And I'm proud to say, as Vice President of the United States, that the American people have been with you every step of the way since 1948. And so we will remain. 
As President Trump declared in his historic visit to Jerusalem, the bond between our two peoples is woven together in the fabric of our hearts. And so it shall always be. Today we remember not simply the liberation of Auschwitz, but also the triumph of freedom, a promise fulfilled, a people restored to their rightful place among the nations of the earth. And we remember, we remember the long night of that past, the survivors and the faces of those we lost the heroes who stood against those evil times. And today we gather, nearly 50 nations strong, here in Jerusalem to say with one voice, never again. <laughs> through pogroms, persecutions, and expulsions in the ghettos, and finally even through the death camps. The Jewish people clung to an ancient promise that he would never leave you or forsake you, and that he would lead this people to inherit the land that he swore to your ancestors that he would give them. And so today, as we bear witness to the strength and the resilience and the faith of the Jewish people, so too we bear witness to God's faithfulness to the Jewish people. May the memory of the martyrs be enshrined in the hearts of all humanity for all time. May God bless the Jewish people, the state of Israel, the United States, and all the nations gathered here. And may he who creates peace in the heavens create peace for us and for all the world. O say shalom bimro ma, hu ye ase shalom. Alenu viakol yes Israel, vayim ru. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. After the fall of France to German occupation, the French underground kept the flame of resistance alive. Free French forces joined the Allies and fought to liberate France and other parts of Western Europe. It is my honor to invite His Excellency, Mr. Emmanuel Macron, President of the French Republic to deliver his remarks. Monsieur le Président de l'État d'Israël. Mr. President of the State of Israel and a dear friend, thank you. Mr. Prime Minister, esteemed heads of states and governments, your majesties, the chairman of Yad Vashem, and the president of the World Holocaust Forum, rabbis, Holocaust survivors, distinguished guests and friends, one and all. 
words can be perceived as something negligent, negligible. But to see you all here convened already says so much. Can one have even imagined this happening nowadays? To be so united in the remembrance, in order to remember, in order to revive and bring back those memories to life. And I am so moved to mention those Holocaust survivors' presence here, and the daughters and the sons of those who were expelled, and the righteous among the, na the nations, those who passed on their testimony and those who have kindled the torch of uh, ad infinitum, of eternity. You are those who have proven till this very day humanity. 75 years ago, nearly today, exactly 75 years ago, on the 27th of January 1945, the brave soldiers of the Red Army went through the gates of Auschwitz-Birkenau in Poland, the occupied Poland by Nazi Germany. Each and every one of you, in turn, described that moment of that astonishment, the shock that the entire mankind sensed and felt. But they, but there were no celebrations, celebrating or cries of joy heard, even anger when they saw what they saw, but just tears of uh, shock and silence. The peoples of Europe were exhausted after the war. It wasn't even an event for the survivors, those who remained. For them, it was some kind of relief because the worst of everything possible had already happened. And I will relate to that because so many children would not find their parents and parents would not find their children ever again because what they had experienced was something that one could not describe in words. And for so many then, it was something that couldn't even be heard or to name it, pourtant, something that one could not even imagine. And, and despite that, some of the survivors overcame that desire to forget by their le desire to tell their story, just as Elie Wiesel said, to tell the story of the child who, in one little shelter, asked his mother in hiding, quietly, quietly, can I now cry? And that beggar who, in that wagon, started singer so that his soul would be conveyed to another. And that little child who whispered to the grandparents and said, don't, be, don't fear dying. It's not so beautiful here. After all, she was only seven. And all of these are words of truth. They indeed happened. Yes. And yes, we can convey these words, gestures, and their last breath in order to do so. One needed to Shimon Dubnov, give him that response when he said, brethren, write it all down so that we'll be able to tell it for the sake of posterity, for the future generations. We have to continue the work of Itzhak Johnson, who in that darkness in Grenoble, he actually documented it and he, and he inaugurated that center. So in, despite those dismal darkness, they collected and documented testimonies and reconstructed the documents and created an archives of the Jewish victims. And they were fulfilling their role while they were also trying to, be, to remain alive 
after those dismal times and the Nazis in order to forget everything. You needed such, such power. Serge and Beata Klausfeld, for example, what power they had in order to find those names and find those, uh, the perpetrators, the murderers. All these struggles and all these fights and all these combatants, I would like to think about them with you today. En France. They were people who remembered in France as well. There were horrific things in France as well. And my country and other countries, we raise our eyes to Jerusalem. There were such horrific stories and nails, but we needed a name, an institution that would award them a name, and it was Yad Vashem who immediately stood that test and did so. The victims of heroism and the Holocaust, that those who suffered in that in those atro atrocities and those who remained and survived. After all, this is not just history that one can just read it this way or another. No, there was justice. And there is history with proof and evidence. And there is life of our nations, of our states. Let us not confuse between these things so that we will not be engulfed once again into this horrific and dismal dire times. We must remember those names but not in order to hate in our times, because those commit us to remember and to continue the dialogue and adhere to that. And the friendship, not hatred. What better and more greater symbol is there than to see all of us here today convened together, united, acting in that struggle, combating forgetting, denial, or words of revenge and acts of revenge. What pride I sense when I see so many states, European states represented today, to find myself amongst the German Republic, um, President Steinmeier sitting here, to be beside him and so many others, and to hear you talking from here, Europe, it's incumbent upon it to remain united and to never, ever forget again, and not to actually find oneself in a state of controversy. That is a lesson also to be learned. And the international community, it's incumbent upon them also to never remember never to forget anything of the barbarism and the exclusion and shunning of the others, international law that is committed to protect them and was then trampled upon by the henchmen of Nazis. President Putin, yes, those five members, those establishing members of the United States, they carry that historic responsibility. And I share with you, 75 years on, to reunite and meet once again. And I sincerely hope we will succeed in doing so. After all, we are witnesses to that history. And since the end of the Second World War, we are those who must promise world order that leans upon laws and the dignity of mankind and, and maintaining their, their rights. That is something that we are committed to. We must have the unity of the international um, community and Europe, because after all, anti-Semitism has once again, and the scourge of it has re returned. And together with anti-Semitism, that entourage of intolerance and xenophobia has also risen its ugly head. And I'm saying this unequivocally, anti-Semitism is not only a problem of the Jews. No, not at all. It is first and foremost the problem of the others. Car à chaque fois dans nos histoires, 
Il a précédé l'effondrement. Il a dit notre faiblesse, la faiblesse de la démocratie. Il a traduit l'incapacité de l'accepté Il est toujours la première forme de rejet de l'autre. Et quand l'antisémitisme apparaît, il y a toujours les divisions se propagent. Then racism also flourished, and all that was was chaotic, and no one could become a victor in all that. Yes, we are here today. We have convened today because, with this new anti-Semitism, we should never give up. We should continue fighting, Moshe, dear Moshe Kanto. You mentioned that each and every one of us in our own countries, through laws, texts, statements. And through réel, vigilance, virtuel, we must maintain those that order on, in the virtual world as well, because the, that, that all that the vitriol is heard there, and we have to be very. We must understand that that is what happens, and we should be vigilant about it and stop it and curb it. We must believe that nowadays we should not let our children who are now again entrapped in those same hatred discourses. They sh we, sh we thought it was behind us, but no. Here, our presence in Yad Vashem, that in itself, and the presence of our youth here at Yad Vashem, that in itself embeds within it is a revival of those, because after all, we've just seen that horrific revival of such horrible things. So we must ensure that hatred and racism is poison that has such a toxic effect. And other and those who believe in it and those who are with it, they become accomplices. I truly believe that education Contre les haines contemporaines. is our antidote. Pays yes, that will protect us against anti-Semitism. One of the greatest um, French authors condemned those Peggy, people who sort of became indifferent, those people who simply enabled things France, to happen and stood by in silence. But we will not allow that to happen because we will Parfois. promise remembrance and we promise to take steps. Toi. Remember and do not forget. Souviens-toi, n'oublie jamais. Remember, do not forget ever. This oath Elle a gravé in the la mémoire heart de la of Shoah Judaism, dans le de ses lois. the French Republic is adopting it écoles. and cherishing it and engraving it on its banner in its hearts and teaching it in its schools la and France writing the names of those Chirac children, son commemorating their names on our plaques. President Chirac, who recognized that, said that this was unforgivable unforgivable the way the Jewish um, French Jews were expelled and we owe so much to those who in the churches and villages of France hid those children and Jews and adults 240,000 were saved when 11,000 were expelled to the death camps France knows exactly what they owe to that resilience and what unites those who try and give up will find against them our perseveration, pers perseverance as a nation. Those who survive, they are heroes, and they are now conveying things passing it forward and on to the future generations. And our children will also 
have to become those who will also convey that message. They will become the witnesses of the witnesses and never give that role up because thanks to what they will learn, they will become those who have the power of knowledge. They know that we do not have the right or the privilege of forgetting and the stories of our victims is a story that is a vibrant, vital one and a crucial one that must be passed on. This will be awe-inspiring to these children because our children will have to protect and defend democracy and humanity that is so fragile and delicate and one must fortify it time and time again. So we are uniting here today once again in order to draw that inspiration and award it to our youth so that they will find in their hearts the valor, the courage, so that on the day that they need to, they will be able to stand strong and defend our values. And they too will be able to say through knowledge that everything they saw and experienced and understood never again, never again. Thank you, President Macron. While Germany sought to break British resolve through brutal bombings, the United Kingdom remained steadfast. British forces, together with those of other allies, drove the Nazis back through North Africa and Europe and liberated Bergen-Belsen and other German concentration camps. It is my honor to invite His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, to deliver his remarks. Survivors of the Shoah, President Rifflin, Your Majesties, Your Excellencies, Ladies and gentlemen, it is a particular honor, although one of the most solemn kind, to be present here today and uh, on behalf of the United Kingdom to commemorate all those so tragically lost in the Shoah. To come to this sacred place, Yad Vashem, a memorial and a name, is to be faced with that for which no name, no words, and no language can ever possibly do justice. The magnitude of the genocide that was visited upon the Jewish people defies comprehension and can make those of us who live in the shadow of those indescribable events feel hopelessly inadequate. The scale of the evil was so great, the impact so profound, that it threatens to obscure the countless individual human stories of tragedy, loss, and suffering of which it was comprised. That is why places like this and events like this are so vitally important. For many of you, you here, and for Jewish people across the globe, those stories are your stories. Whether you witnessed and somehow endured the appalling barbarity of the Holocaust personally, or whether it touched your lives through the experience of your loved ones, or through the loss of parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, or other family you were never able to know. But we must never forget that they are also our story, a story of incomprehensible inhumanity from which all humanity can and must learn. 
For that an evil cannot be described does not mean that it cannot be defeated. That it cannot be fully understood does not mean that it cannot be overcome. And so it is of particular significance that we should gather here in Israel where so many of those who survived the Holocaust sought and found refuge and built a new future for themselves and this country. In the same way, it has been a singular privilege throughout my life to have met so many Holocaust survivors who were welcomed to the United Kingdom and who began new lives there, contributing immeasurably to the welfare of our country and the world in the years that followed. I, I have such inspiring memories of remarkable people, such as Anita Lasker Wolfish, who somehow survived both Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen before moving to Britain after the war. There, as a wonderfully talented cellist, she co-founded the English Chamber Orchestra, of which I am proud to have been patron for the past 43 years. On her arm, she bears the number by which tyranny had sought to make her less than human. Yet through her music, she reminds us of the greatest beauty of which we are capable. Over the years, she has shared her story bravely and powerfully, determined that some good might come from the unspeakable evil she endured and overcame. From the horror, she brought harmony, healing, and hope. Just as each life lost in the Shoah stands for all the millions who died, each inspirational story such as that of Anita Lasker Wolfish stands for the strength of spirit, the unparalleled courage, the determined defiance of the very best of humanity when confronted with the very worst. For my own part, I have long drawn inspiration from the selfless actions of my dear grandmother, Princess Alice of Greece, who in 1943, in Nazi-occupied Athens, saved a Jewish family by taking them into her home and hiding them. My grandmother, who is buried on the Mount of Olives, has a tree planted in her name here at Yad Vashem and is counted as one of the righteous among the nations. Haside Umut Olam. A fact which gives me and my family immense pride. Ladies and gentlemen, almost a lifetime has passed since the horror of the Holocaust unfolded on the European continent. And those who bore witness to it are sadly ever fewer. We must, therefore, commit ourselves to ensuring that their stories live on, to be known and understood by each successive generation. Anita Lasker Wolfish has said, there is a risk that the Holocaust will be placed under a glass bubble, just like the Napoleonic Wars or the Thirty Years' War. But if we don't make the connection between memories of past atrocities and the present, there isn't any point to it. She is, it seems to me, absolutely right. The Holocaust must never be allowed to become simply a fact of history. We must never cease to be appalled nor moved by the testimony of those who lived through it. 
their experience must always educate and guide and warn us. The lessons of the Holocaust are searingly relevant to this day. 75 years after the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau, hatred and intolerance still lurk in the human heart, still tell new lies, adopt new disguises, and still seek new victims. All too often, language is used which turns disagreement into dehumanization. Words are used as badges of shame to mark others as enemies, to brand those who are different as somehow deviant. All too often, virtue seems to be sought through verbal violence. All too often, real violence ensues and acts of unspeakable cruelty are still perpetrated around the world against people for reasons of their religion, their race, or their beliefs. Knowing as we do the darkness to which such behavior leads, we must be vigilant in discerning these ever-changing threats. We must be fearless in confronting falsehoods and resolute in resisting words and acts of violence. We must never rest in seeking to create mutual understanding and respect. We must tend the earth of our societies so that the seeds of division cannot take root and grow. And we must never forget that every human being is Betzalem Elohim, in the image of God. And even a single human life is Keolam Malay, like an entire universe. <laughs> the Holocaust was an appalling Jewish tragedy, but it was also a universal human tragedy and one which we compound if we do not heed its lessons. On this day, in this place, and in memory of the millions who perished in the Shoah, let us recommit ourselves to tolerance and respect, and to ensuring that those who lived through this darkness will forever, as in the words of the prophet Isaiah, be a light unto the nations to guide the generations that follow. Thank you, Your Royal Highness. We remember here the one and a half million Jewish soldiers who fought in the Allied armies. Nearly 200,000 of these soldiers were killed in combat. Victor Ullmann was a gifted Austrian Jewish composer, conductor, and pianist who was deported to the Tresenstadt ghetto in September 1942. While imprisoned, under horrific conditions, Ullmann continued to compose music and formed an orchestra. He wrote, by no means did we sit weeping on the banks of the waters of Babylon. Our endeavor with respect to the arts was commensurate with our will to live. Victor Ullmann was murdered in the gas chambers of Auschwitz-Birkenau on October 18, 1944 but his spirit lives on through his music. We will now hear the last movement from Ullmann's seventh piano sonata written while he was incarcerated in Tresenstadt.
Nazi, Nazi Germany, which launched World War II, also initiated and perpetrated the Holocaust. After five and a half years of bloodshed and destruction, Germany was defeated. Since then, Germany has undergone a complex process of coming to terms with its actions before and during the war, and with its special historic responsibilities. German leaders have expressed their nation's commitment to ensuring that the legacy of the Shoah remains forever a crucial aspect of Germany's identity. It is my honor to invite His Excellency, Mr. Frank Walter Steinmeier, President of the Federal Republic of Germany, to deliver his remarks. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech Haolam, Sheher Chelaranu, Veki Yamanu, Vihigyanu Lazman Haze. Sumatana, Uma Sechel Chaset. It is a gift and a gift of mercy to be able to address you here at Yad Vashem on this day. The Excellency Professor Rivlin, President Rivlin, and Dr. Moshe Kantel, thank you for your invitation. Excellencies, guests from all over the world, and most of all, esteemed witnesses and survivors of the Shoah. Here at Yad Vashem burns the eternal flame in remembrance of the victims of the Shoah. This place reminds us of their suffering, the suffering of millions, and it reminds us of their lives, each individual life. This place remembers Samuel Tittelmann, a keen swimmer who won competitions for Maccabi Warsaw, and his little sister Riga, who helped her mother prepare the family meal for Thavas. This place remembers Ida Goldish and her three-year-old son, Willy. In October, they were deported from Chisinau Ghetto, and in January, in the bitter cold, Ida wrote her last letter to her parents. I quote, I regret from the very depths of my soul that on departing, I did not realize the importance of the moment that I did not hug you tightly, never releasing you from my arms. Germans deported them. Germans burned numbers on their forearms. Germans tried to dehumanize them, to reduce them to numbers, to erase all memory of them in the extermination camps. They did not succeed. Samuel and Riga, Ida and Willi were human beings, and as human beings, they live on in our memory. Yet Vashem gives them, as it says in the book of Isaiah, a monument and a name. I, too, stand before this monument as a human being and as a German. I stand before their monument, I read their names, I hear their stories, and I bow in deepest sorrow. Samuel and Riga, Ida and Willi were human beings. 
And this also must be said here, the perpetrators were human beings, they were Germans, those who murdered, those who planned and helped in the murdering, and the many who silently towed the line, they were Germans. The industrial mass murder of six million Jews, the worst crime in the history of humanity, it was committed by my countrymen. The terrible war, which cost far more than 50 million lives, is originated from my country. 75 years later, after the liberation of Auschwitz, I stand before you all as president of Germany and I stand here laden with the heavy historical burden of guilt. Yet, at the same time, my heart is filled with gratitude. Gratitude for the hands of the survivors stretched out to us. Gratitude for the new trust given to us by people in Israel and across the world. Gratitude for Jewish life is flourishing again in Germany. My soul is moved by this spirit of reconciliation, a spirit which opened up a new and peaceful path for Germany and Israel, for Germany, Europe, and the countries of the world. The eternal flame at Yad Vashem does not go out. Germany's responsibility does not expire. We want to live up to our responsibility. By this, dear friends, you should measure us. I stand before you grateful for this miracle of reconciliation, and I wish I could say that our remembrance has made us immune to evil. Yes, we Germans remember, but sometimes it seems as though we understand the past better than the present. The spirits of evil are emerging in a new guise, presenting their anti-Semitic, racist, authoritarian thinking as an answer for the future, a new solution to the problems of our age. And I wish I could say that we Germans have learned from history once and for all. But I cannot say that when hatred is spreading. I cannot say that when Jewish children are sped on in the schoolyard. I cannot say that when crude anti-Semitism is clogged in supposed criticism of Israeli policy. And I cannot say that, ladies and gentlemen, when only a thick wooden door prevents a right-wing terrorist from causing a massacre, a bloodbath in a synagogue in the city of Halle on Yom Kippur. Of course, our age is a different age. The words are not the same. The perpetrators are not the same. But it is the same evil. And there remains only one answer. Never again, nie wieder. That is why there cannot be an end to remembrance. This responsibility was woven into the very fabric of the Federal Republic of Germany from day one. But it tests us here and now. This Germany will only live up to itself if it lives up to its historical responsibility. We fight anti-Semitism. We resist to the poison that is nationalism. We protect Jewish life. We stand with Israel. And here in Yad Vashem, 
I renew this promise before the eyes of the world. And I know that we are not alone. Today we join together to say no to anti-Semitism, no to hatred. From the horror of Auschwitz, the world learned lessons once before. The nations of the world built an order of peace founded upon human rights and international law. We Germans are committed to this order and we want to defend it with all of you because this we know, peace can be destroyed and people can be corrupted. Esteemed heads of state and government, I'm grateful that together we make this commitment today, a world that remembers the Holocaust, a world without genocide. Who knows? Who knows if we will ever hear again the magical sound of life? Who knows if we can weave ourselves into eternity? Who knows? Salman Gradovsky wrote these lines in Auschwitz and buried them in a tin can under the crematorium. Here at Yad Vashem, they are woven into eternity. Salman Gradovsky, Samuel and Riga Tittelmann, Ida and Billy Goldish, and so many others. They were all murdered. Their lives were lost to unfettered hatred but our remembrance of them will defeat the abyss and our action will defeat hatred. Ladies and gentlemen, by this I stand, for this I hope. Baruch Rata Adonai, Shechayanu, Bekimanu, Vegyanu, Lazman. Blessed be the God that we have reached and enabled us to be here. Thank you, President Steinmeier. Meaningful Holocaust remembrance is rooted in authentic testimony and freely researched facts presented accurately. The legacy of the Holocaust is conveyed in museums, educational centers, and authentic historical sites in Europe and around the world. We acknowledge recent governmental initiatives such as that of the Ukrainian government in Babiyal, the Polish government in Sobibor, and the British government in London. They represent the ongoing responsibility to document, teach, and commemorate in a relevant manner. During the Holocaust, six million Jews were murdered. During the Second World War, millions more from other communities, cultures, and faiths were killed. Mourning and commemoration are often expressed by the universal language of music. We will now hear excerpts from requiems by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, Carl Jenkins, and Camille Sansons. The orchestra will be joined by choirs from France, Russia, the United Kingdom, and the United States that have come together to represent the peace and harmony that we all strive for.
In addition to the Allied armies, during the war, partisan, underground, and other forces fought bravely against the Nazis and their collaborators. During the Holocaust, there was a small minority who mustered extraordinary courage to uphold human values. These were the righteous among the nations, non-Jews who took great risks to rescue Jews during the Holocaust. These courageous persons, over 27,000 recognized already, came from different nations, religions, and walks of life. At the same time, countless numbers of Jews compounded their already tremendous risks during the Holocaust to save their fellow Jews under truly impossible circumstances. We are now about to hear from one of the many thousands of Jews who were rescued during the Shoah by their fellow Jews and by righteous non-Jews. Rabbi Israel Meir Lau, former chief rabbi of Israel, was born in 1937 in Poland. When liberated in 1945 from the Buchenwald concentration camp, he was, he was one of its youngest survivors. Rabbi Lau is chairman of the Yad Vashem Council and a prominent spokesman for the now dwindling community of Holocaust survivors. I am honored to invite Rabbi Lau to deliver his remarks. President Rivlin, Prime Minister Netanyahu, President of the World Holocaust Forum, Dr. Kanto, leaders of the world, you are here in gathered leaders of the world, everyone in his country. We have met last night, and I see you today. And I thank you for your kind and warm and touching words you gave us in your speeches, your brotherhood, your friendship, your love, and your commitment for the future. We will never forget. We appreciate it very, very much and very, very deep. Survivors, <clears throat> brothers and sisters, survivors, people of Israel, leaders, Morai Rabotai, ladies and gentlemen. 25 years ago was 50 years to the liberation of Buchenwald concentration camp liberated by the American army on April 11, 45. I was invited to give a speech for the survivors who survived the camp and survived 50 years later. I came with my brother, late brother Naftali, my hero who saved my life. We came from Israel to Germany. Weimar is the city. Buchenwald is a suburb of Weimar. And I started my words with this comment. This is my second visit to Buchenwald. The third one was 50 and a half years earlier. And what is the change? When I came here for the first time, I was a child of seven and a half years. No father anymore, no mother anymore, but a brother. I came here, I had no name. I was just a number. Heftling, Nummer 117030. Prisoner, 117030. Prisoner. Seven and a half years. What a crime did I do till then to be a prisoner. No name. No identity almost. Fifty years later, I come from my old new 
homeland, the state of Israel. I have a name. My name is Israel Meir Lau. I am not a prisoner anymore. I am the chief rabbi of Israel today. What a change. With such a change from the first visit to the second one, you would say, okay, let's forget it. Let's open a new page, a new chapter. Let's forgive, let's forget. So I came especially to tell you, I cannot forgive because I'm not authorized to forgive. My parents, before they went away, before they were taken away, they didn't ask me to forgive. They asked me to continue the chain, that the Jewish chain will be unbroken, <laughs> unbroken eh, forever. That's what they said. I do remember my mother, I was already seven and a half almost, Gedenk remember that you are a Jew. Wherever you go, remember you are a part of a rabbinic chain. Your father, I don't know what happened to him, two years that I didn't hear from him. Your father was the 37th generation of a rabbinic dynasty. You are the 38th, continue the chain, go on. This were the last years. She didn't speak about forgiveness. What else do you ask me? To forget, forget? How can I forget? How can I forget the beatings, the freezings, the starvation? I do remember always also the stars in the very dark tunnel we went through five and a half years, the righteous among the nations. For some of them, I owe my life. I do remember. But I do remember the sufferings. I do remember the tortures. I do remember the victims. And I can never forget. This is the reason I came from Israel to tell you. Now I want to tell you, dear friends here in Yad Vashem, we appreciate very much your arrival. We appreciate very much your promise to fight anti-Semitism and racism. This is a promise. This is an obligation. This is a duty of mankind at all. And this we will never forget what you have said here today. And we appreciate every word you said to us. And we believe you that you said it from the bottom of your heart. We do believe. We do believe that this evening here in Yad Vashem in Yerushalayim can be a bridge for mankind at all, not only around the Holocaust, but around survival of the world of mankind. What do I mean? If you open the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, and you meet there what? The story of Noah's Ark. There was a flood. And Noah was said by the Lord Almighty, built an ark, and all the animals and your family get in into the ark, you will be saved. You will survive it, the flood. 150 days they were in the ark. Who was there? Snakes, leopards, tigers, lions, bears, and also animals like cows and donkeys and hens and doves. One was held by the other 150 days under the same roof. No one was beaten, no one was hidden, no one was killing, no one was slaughtering, no one eat the other 150 days. Snakes and children Grandchildren of Noah, no one was hurt. Why? They behaved very nice because they knew that they must behave very nice because there is a common enemy outside of the ark, the flood. And if they will not behave nicely, Noah will 
sent them out of the ark and they are liquidated. They will disappear. So they understood we must live in friendship because we have a common hatred, a common enemy. People, leaders of the world, my, our guest leaders, don't we have today common, common enemies? Don't we have a reason? to understand what the snake understood in the Ark of Noah. Can't we understand that there are common enemies, all kinds of diseases, the cancer, the AIDS, whatever, heart, brain, starvation, ignorance, crime, nuclear weapon, common enemies. So let's behave like friends. Let's understand at least was the animals understood. 150 days. They didn't hurt. Let's understand, and this can come here. It can come from Yad Vashem. It can come from Yerushalayim. As the prophet Isaiah and the prophet Mika said the same words, Ki mitzion Torah, Udvar Hashem Mirushalayim. The voice of the Lord Almighty comes and be spread all over the world. It came from Jerusalem, a city of 4,000 years history. We can never forget. We have to forgive to brothers, and we have to behave like friends and brothers. That's our duty, and this is the conclusion of seeing you, leaders of the world. The world is in your arms, in your hands, in one way, one sentence, one signature. You can decide upon millions of people. So decide for love and friendship and peace forever. Thank you. Thank you. Toda Raba, Rabbi Lau. I am honored to invite Mr. Avner Shalev, Chairman of the Yad Vashem Directorate, to deliver the concluding message of this event. I'm writing this letter before my death. Although I don't know the exact day my relatives and I will be killed just because we are Jews. How I yearn to live and reach some good in life, but everything is lost. Farewell. These were the last words of Fania Barbakov before she was murdered in the Droya Ghetto in 1942. The Holocaust was the most deadly manifestation of anti-Semitism. It was the outcome 
of an extreme racist ideology adapted by a modern state to blame one group for all ills of the others. Nazi antisemitism was used to legitimize unprecedented cruelty. The systematic murder of millions of innocent people. Even today, the Holocaust seems almost impossible to grasp, but we must do just that, because while the Nazi plan was aimed against the Jews, anti-Semitic atrocities never end with the Jews. The Holocaust was a calamity for the Jewish people and a catastrophe for all people. The Shoah proved that modernity does not ensure morality. Values do not necessarily progress along with technology. 75 years after liberation, Holocaust remembrance is more relevant than ever. It serves as a lighthouse warning us of the danger of extreme racist ideologies. Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center, is the gatekeeper of Holocaust memory. It is here in Jerusalem that the voices and legacy of the Shoah victims and survivors are gathered, preserved, and made accessible for all humanity. Memory must be translated into action. Antisemitism and all other forms of racism will never be diminished through silence. Tackling antisemitism today requires a range of policies and tools, locally, nationally, and internationally. The international forms, such as our hearings today, fortify a united front against any expressions of racism anywhere in the world. Our mutual duty is to educate the upcoming generations. It is our duty to ensure that everyone understands what constitutes anti-Semitism and remembers where it had led us in the past. As an educator, I realized early on that Yad Vashem must create the International School for Holocaust Studies. Professionals from around the world learn accurate facts about the Shoah and how to communicate the meanings to their communities, peers, and students. Our comprehensive research, numerous exhibitions, robust online presence are additional means to disseminate our knowledge to the global audience. We are all here today because we share a deep concern about what is happening around the world. Your presence give us hope, hope of overcoming Holocaust denial and distortion, hope of securing individual rights and human dignity for all societies. Hope that the world that we entrust to our children will be kinder and more tolerant than the one we inherited from our own parents. Despite the horrors that they witnessed and endured, Holocaust survivors, such as our dear friend Rabbi Lau, did not lose faith in humanity. They chose life and contributed to every society they joined. In 2002, survivors representatives signed a declaration here at Yad Vashem. To the next generations they wrote, we pass on a Jewish message that memory leads to moral obligation as has been said by many other leaders. Memory must be the basis of action and a source of strength 
for building a better world. Thank you all for coming and sharing your ideas with us. You should be blessed. Thank you, Mr. Shalev. Seventy-five years after the fall of Nazi Germany, anti-Semitism is on the rise, reaching levels not seen since the Holocaust. Today, our societies face not just latent anti-Semitism, but a worldwide crisis of anti-Semitic hate. Once again, Jewish shops are being smashed and Jewish graves desecrated. Once again, Jews are being attacked on the street. Once again, this hate is moving in more and more places. From the margins to the mainstream, from words to extreme violence. Germany is in shock after an anti-Semitic attack on a synagogue. Eh bien, les forces de police en France lancer l'assaut sur l'hypercacher se sont saisies. Eleven people died after a gunman opened fire during morning service. Once again, Jews are being murdered simply for being Jews. In 2018 alone, there were 387 violent anti-Semitic incidents, over 100 violent attacks in the U.S. 68 in the UK, 35 in Germany, a 74% increase in all types of anti-Semitic attacks in France, a 60% increase in Italy, Australia, 59%, South Africa, 25%. In the face of this crisis, no country is immune. This age-old prejudice is being led by a new triangle of hate a convergence of the far right, far left, and radical Islamism. Today, extremists can spread their propaganda to millions at the touch of a button. And if they come to power, they may have access to the deadliest weapons known to humanity. Contemporary anti-Semitism finds expression in many forms. Anti-Jewish conspiracy theories, Holocaust denial, and the glorification of the Nazis and their collaborators. At times, anti-Semitism is disguised as anti-Zionism. Hatred of Jews can manifest itself in hatred of the Jewish state. Anti-Semitic motifs are used to blame Israel for all the world's ills. And while Jews are the first victims, the ultimate target of this triangle of hate is the very societies in which they live. ISIS has claimed responsibility. Incitement and hate are a means for extremists to attack the foundations of democracies, destabilize governments, and increase their power. Anti-Semitism is not a problem for the Jewish community alone. It is a menace to democratic values, to social peace and stability. Not only are there vile views coming into the mainstream, but the mainstream is unfortunately sometimes coming to them. The recent wave of anti-Semitism has already taken too many innocent lives. As the Nazis rose to power, the world did not wake up in time. The world ignored the spread of anti-Jewish propaganda and hate. When the gates of the camps swung open, the world came face to face with the consequences of hatred. Never again is now. Now is the time to fight back. This is a fight not only for the safety of Jewish communities, but for the survival of our nations. The worldwide crisis of anti-Semitism threatens us all, and we must all fight it together.
The distinguished heads of delegations present here today, as well as leaders of additional countries invited to this forum but unable to attend, have made a memorable contribution to Holocaust remembrance and to the fight against anti-Semitism. Each of them has submitted a personal message attesting to their own commitment and that of their nations to remembering the Holocaust and fighting anti-Semitism. These messages have been compiled in a special commemorative volume, which we are pleased to inaugurate and distribute to all the participants here today. The book reflects our shared commitment to effectively transmit the legacy of the Shoah to future generations. We will now conduct a memorial ceremony in memory of those who perished. I am honored to invite Mr. Benny Handel to lead the ceremony. Thank you and shalom. Thank you, Tamar. We have gathered here in the Warsaw Ghetto Square at Yad Vashem on the Mount of Remembrance, Jerusalem, to commemorate the six million Jews murdered by the Nazis and their collaborators. I'm honored to invite Holocaust survivors Ms. Rose Moskowitz and Ms. Coletta Vital, chairperson of the Central Organization of Holocaust Survivors in Israel, to light the memorial torch. Identification. As we kindle the memorial torch, we unite with the blessed memory of six million of our people who died a martyr's death at the hands of the German Nazis and their collaborators, of the Jewish communities destroyed in a wicked attempt to eradicate the name and culture of Israel. We remember with veneration the fortitude of the fighters who kindled the sublime flame of rebellion among the besieged masses of the ghettos, the heroic and persistent struggle of the masses of the House of Israel on the threshold of destruction for their human dignity and their Jewish heritage, the righteous among the nations who risked their lives to save Jews from persecution and death. We will now invite the heads of delegations to lay memorial wreaths at the foot of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising Monument. The wreaths will be presented to the heads of delegations by members of the Jerusalem Youth Council. The Honorable Reuven Ruvi Rivlin, President of the State of Israel. The Honorable Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister of the State of Israel.
His Majesty King Willem Alexander of the Netherlands. His Majesty, King Philippe, the King of the Belgians. His Majesty King Felipe VI of Spain. His Royal Highness Henri, Grand Duke of Luxembourg. His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, the United Kingdom. His Royal Highness, Crown Prince Håkon Magnus of Norway. His Excellency Mr. Ilir Meta, President of the Republic of Albania. His Excellency Mr. Alberto Fernandez, President of the Argentine Republic. His Excellency Mr. Armen Sarkisyan, President of the Republic of Armenia.
His Excellency General, the Honorable David Hurley, AC, DSC, FTSE, Governor General of the Commonwealth of Australia. His Excellency, Professor Dr. Alexander van der Bellen, President of the Federal Republic of Austria. His Excellency, Mr. Jelko Komšić, Chairman of the Presidency of Bosnia and Herzegovina. His Excellency, Mr. Rumen Radev, President of the Republic of Bulgaria. Her Excellency, the Right Honorable Julie Payette, Governor General of Canada. Her Excellency, Mrs. Kolinda Grabar Kitarovic, President of the Republic of Croatia. His Excellency Mr. Nikos Anastasiades, President of the Republic of Cyprus. His Excellency Mr. Andrei Babish, Prime Minister of the Czech Republic. Her Excellency, Ms. Mete Fredriksen, Prime Minister of Denmark.
REITs of the European Union, His Excellency Mr. Charles Michel, President of the European Council, Her Excellency Ms. Ursula von der Leyen, President of the European Commission, His Excellency Mr. David Sassoli, President of the European Parliament. His Excellency, Mr. Sauli Niinistö, President of the Republic of Finland. His Excellency, Monsieur Emmanuel Macron, President of the French Republic. Her Excellency, Mrs. Salome Zurabishvili, President of Georgia. His Excellency Dr. Frank Walter Steinmeier, President of the Federal Republic of Germany. His Excellency Mr. Prokopios Pavlopoulos, President of the Hellenic Republic. His Excellency, Mr. Janos Ader, President of Hungary. His Excellency, Mr. Vudni Johannesson, President of the Republic of Iceland.
His Excellency Mr. Sergio Mattarella, President of the Republic of Italy. His Excellency Mr. Igor Dodon, President of the Republic of Moldova. His Excellency Mr. Serge Tell, Minister of State of the Principality of Monaco. His Excellency Mr. Milo Djukanovic, President of Montenegro. His Excellency Professor Dr. Stevo Penderovsky, President of the Republic of North Macedonia. His Excellency Mr. Marcelo Ribelo de Souza, President of the Portuguese Republic. His Excellency Mr. Klaus Johannes, President of Romania. His Excellency Mr. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, President of the Russian Federation. His Excellency Mr. Aleksandar Vucic, President of the Republic of Serbia.
Her Excellency Ms. Zuzana Chaputova, President of the Slovak Republic. His Excellency Mr. Borut Pahor, President of the Republic of Slovenia. His Excellency Mr. Stefan Löfven, Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Sweden. His Excellency Mr. David Friedman, Ambassador of the United States to the State of Israel for Vice President Mike Pence. His Excellency Mr. Oktay Asado, Chairman of the Mili Medjlis, National Assembly of the Republic of Azerbaijan. His Excellency Mr. Vladimir Andreychenko, Chairman of the House of Representatives, National Assembly of the Republic of Belarus. Her Excellency, Ms. Inara Murniece, Speaker of the Parliament of the Republic of Latvia. His Excellency Mr. Viktoras Pratskietis, Speaker of the Parliament of the Republic of Lithuania.
The Honorable Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House of Representatives of the United States of America. His Eminence Cardinal Kurt Koch, President of the Holy See's Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews. The Honorable Moshe Leon, Mayor of the City of Jerusalem. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Cantor Shai Abramson will now recite El Male Rachamim, a prayer for the souls of the martyrs. Please rise. Shalom, 
Mr. Naftali Deutsch, Holocaust survivor, will now recite Kaddish, the mourner's prayer. Gadal is Kadash Meiraba Balma di Barakurusei, Bayamlik Malkutei, Bahayehon, Ubayamehon, Ubahaye, the whole Beit Israel, Bagala, Bizman Karif, Vimru, Amen. Yeh <laughs> Leila min kol birchata b'shirata tush b'chata b'nechamata dam yiram b'yama v'imru amen yehei shlama raba mishamayim v'chayim Aleinu al kol Yisrael v'imru amen. Ose shalom b'mromav. Hu yase shalom aleinu al kol Yisrael v'nomar amen. You may be seated. Not for long. Soon we will hold a moment of silence 
in memory of the six million Jews murdered in the Holocaust and other victims of Nazi Germany. It is my honor to call on stage Cardinal Kurt Koch, Mr. Serge Tell, Minister of State Monaco, Ms. Inara Murmietze, Speaker Latvia, Mr. Viktoras Pankcietis, Speaker Belarus, Mr. Oktay Asadov, Chair National Assembly Azerbaijan, Ms. Nancy Pelosi, Speaker United States, Ms. Mette Fredriksen, Prime Minister, Denmark, Mr. Andrei Babish, Prime Minister of the Czech Republic. Please come forward. Governor General David Hurley, Australia. Governor General Julie Payet, Canada. Mr. Ilir Meta, President, Albania. Mr. Alberto Fernandez, President, Argentina. Mr. Armen Sarkisian, President, Armenia. Dr. Alexander van der Bellen, President, Austria. Mr. Zeljko Komšić, Chairman of Presidency, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Mr. Rumen Radev, President of Bulgaria. Mrs. Kolinda Grabar Kitarovic, President of Croatia. Mr. David Sassoli, President of the European Parliament. Mr. Charles Michel, President of the European Council. Ms. Ursula von der Leyen, President of the European Commission. Mr. Nikos Anastiades, President of Cyprus. Mr. Sauli Niniste, President of Finland. Mrs. Salome Zurabishvili, President of Georgia. Mr. Prokopios Pavlopoulos, President of the Hellenic Republic. Mr. Ader Janos, President of Hungary. Mr. Guzni Johansson, President of Iceland. Mr. Igor Dodon, President of Moldova. Mr. Milo Djukanovic, President of Montenegro. Professor Dr. Stevo Pendarovsky, President of North Macedonia. Mr. Marcelo Ribelu de Souza, President of the Portuguese Republic. Mr. Klaus Ioannis, President of Romania. His Majesty King Willem Alexander of the Netherlands, Mr. Alexander Vucic, President of Serbia, Ms. Zuzana Chaputova, President of the Slovak Republic, Mr. Borut Pahor, President of Slovenia, Mr. Stefan Lufven, Prime Minister of Sweden, His Majesty King of the Belgians, His Majesty King Felipe VI of Spain, his Royal Highness Henri of Luxembourg, His Royal Highness Crown Prince Håkon Magnus of Norway. Mr. Sergio Mattarella, Dr. Frank Walter Steinmeier, President of Germany, Mr. Reuven Rivlin, our own President, Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu, our Prime Minister, Rabbi Yisrael Meir Lau, Dr. Moshe Kantor, Mr. Avner Shalev.
Ladies and gentlemen, would you kindly rise for the moment of silence? Please remain standing for the singing of the national anthem of the State of Israel, Hatikva. You may be seated. This concludes our program. We thank you all for participating. Please remain seated until the dignitaries have ex exited. Thank you. <laughs>